She lives in Marlborough in Wiltshire, so very close to Avebury, uh, where many of you uh, are familiar with. And she runs there the Avebury School of Esoteric Studies, um, running certificated courses um, uh, there. And in her dowsing, she's aware that the land itself emits a cer certain energies, which is why the sacred sites were put there in the first place. She's going to be exploring this theme, going all the way back to Atlantis, all the way to Stonehenge. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Maria Wheatley. <laughs> Well, thanks uh, for having me along, Andy and the team. It's great to be here at the Glastonbury Symposium. And what I'm going to do today is talk about some ley lines that are really very different than your standard ley. And we're going to look at some earth energies. And we're going to be looking at the evidence and the proof for earth energies as well. Because our ancient ancestors were fully aware of not just the energies within the ground, but how the planets above can activate lay energy systems. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So on our first slide that you see here, this was discovered in 1846 by an antiquarian called Edward Duke. And what Edward Duke discovered was that there was this massive ley line coursing through the landscape that linked Stonehenge and Avebury together. The one thing about the antiquarians that they share in common, for example, Edward Duke, who discovered this line, William Stukeley, who wrote an awful lot about Avebury and Stonehenge, before him, even before uh, these two guys, there was John Aubrey. All of them were high-ranking Masons. And uh, Edward Duke lives in the house, uh, well, he lived in the house that Sting lives in today at West Amesbury. It had a massive occult library. And within that occult library that maybe Sting still has today, <laughs> we'll have to call on him and see, uh, this map uh, was produced. We can see here that Stonehenge is right at the bottom, if I just point that out to you. Stonehenge is at the bottom, then we have Castley Camp, Marden, Mercury, uh, which is Walker's Hill, a great long bar, I'll discuss in a moment. And we have Silbury Hill right at the middle, and Avebury representing the Temple of the Sun and the Moon. And right at the top, we have uh, the Orbit of Venus, which was rep represented by a beautiful stone circle we'll be having a look at. But in Edward Duke's system, he said that it was Silbury Hill that anchored in the whole of that ley line across the system. Now, I know there's John Cowie here today. He's written a lot about Silbury in a book called Silbury Dawning. And in my understanding of Silbury Hill, it's not just a heap of earth. It's actually, uh, in part, a seven-step chalk pyramid. I mean, Silbury Hill was built out of gigantic chalk blocks quarried from nearby. It has a huge layering system within it, a layering system that is identical to an organ generator, like designed by Wilhelm Reich. This literally pours energy up and out of uh, the, the top of the mound here. It's extraordinary. And I met a chap called David Webb. He's an engineer. And we had a look at some of the energy signals emitted by uh, Silbury Hill. The electrostagnetic, uh, electromagnetic field down here is really kind of normal for the area. But when we took some signals right on the top, it was a thousand times greater. This mother mound, if you will, pours energy out into the landscape. And our next test that we're doing will show you what it looked like through the eyes of prehistoric people. But this anchors that whole ley line in together. The Temple of Mercury on that ley line is further on down. I mean, we all are here because we like crop circles. I'm sure we've all heard of Eastfield, haven't we? Yeah, that's the Mecca, isn't it? That's the field. Well, just on the other side of Eastfield, you have Adam's grave, and this represented the Temple of Mercury. And to our ancient ancestors, Mercury was about communication, talking to the gods, talking to the earth, like I am today, talking through the, the spoken word. So could it be that our ancient ancestors were put in these ancient sites representing those orbital paths of the planets because they imbued the land with those, la with those attributes? So when we go to a place like this, like Adam's grave, we're connecting to the powers of Mercury. 
I was asked by Channel 4 last year to meet a chap called Tony Robertson, who's quite a, a left brain archaeologist, uh, to say the least. And uh, he was saying, oh, I want to have a go at dowsing with you, Maria, but I don't think it's going to work for me. Uh, will you do Avebury with me? And I said, no, I'll go to uh, Adam's grave uh, with you, Tony, and we'll douse just here because you will get a reaction for the most powerful lay in the area. And he kind of went, yeah, yeah, whatever. Anyway, he doused across it, and to camera, he actually said, I didn't make the rods move. I didn't make the rods move. So uh, it certainly worked uh, for him. But I was so upset after talking to Tony because I met Jim Leary, and uh, he's uh, a Silbury Hill, left brain archaeologist again, who uh, said on that, that program, Silbury's just a heap of earth. Apparently, according to the archaeologists, everyone had a basket and just dumped a little basket of dirt to create that massive mother mound. Why they say that on TV, I am absolutely shocked. When we go up that ley line, we come to an extraordinary temple. It was said by Edward Duke and all of the Masons that it represented the Temple of Venus. It's right to the north, so we call it a north node. In fact, tucked away in the Bodleian Library was this uh, drawing of William Stukeley, and it's only come to surface within the past five years because tucked away in that Bodleian library is all these types of manuscripts that these former masons have. But anyway, it did surface because there was an archaeological dig, and this was a beautiful temple. This was a concentric stone circle containing over 150 standing stones with an avenue coming down here and two avenues here representing the astrological glyph of Venus in the landscape, anchored right on the lay to Silbury Hill there. Sadly, in 1846, when uh, William Stukeley was drawing these amazing ancient sites, there was what I call the stone-smashing holocaust. Greedy farmers, hell-bent on earning an extra buck, smashed these temples to pieces. And there's only one stone remaining of this beautiful temple. But nonetheless, as we're going to see in the moment, you can take the stones away, you could take a pyramid away, but the energy in the land is eternal, and it will be there forever and a day. So despite the fact that these stones were ripped asunder from their Neolithic birthplace, it's an air of feminine power still exists there that you can feel. And it's like mist, perceptible and elusive, changing with the moods of the season. So even though nothing exists, go there and attune to these energies. And we'll have a look at those in a moment. Further on down the line of uh, Duke's Ley Line, we come to the Temple of Mars, Mardum. It's slightly off the line, but there nonetheless. And there was another gigantic mound, like Silbury Hill, another organ generator in the land. This was a super henge. You think Avebury's pretty big, encompassing 28 acres? This was 36 acres with a henge, that's a ditch and a bank, going round like this, representing the element of Earth, with the river Avebury. Avon creating the other type of enclosure and enclosing these two mother mounds. In the 19th century, a very rich chap called Sir Richard Coltor, very moneyed, like digging, he decided he would uh, put a shaft right through the Hatfield Barrow, as it was called. And sadly, when he did, the whole thing collapsed. So we've lost that mound. But names are an extraordinary thing. Names carry on a tradition. They embody that which was. And here we have Mardum. Den is an old English name for settlement. And Mars is evidently Mars. So this was the settlement of Mars. And again, if our ancient ancestors were linking in those astrological attributes to the land, on that ley line, which we see, transverses energy across the landscape, then this is truly the divine masculine like the Temple of Venus was the Divine Feminine. So again, this was ripped asunder. Nothing is left now of that uh, mighty site, but there was a great archaeological dig about four years ago, and what they found astonished them, because for some reason, the archaeologists think everything's to do with death, don't they? Are they obsessed? Whether you go to the king's chamber, oh, it's all about death. Whether you go here, oh, it's all about death. But when we look at these sites, we can see that there is something magical going on. 
And what they found around here was sophisticated houses, and that kind of blew their mind. What they found over here was sweat lodges and toilets and places to wash. And they give us the image that these were kind of ancestors of dressed in uh, animal skins and going heave ho with big stones across the landscape. And we'll challenge that idea and show you how you can move a stone actually quite easily. And we're hoping to do a big model of this uh, in real life rather than just theory. So this was one of their temples. Now, could you imagine going from Avebury to Stonehenge? You would be walking the ancient landscape ceremonially because that ley line isn't just a line that you imagine across the landscape. It was a massive track. It was a massive track that you could walk along, linking all of these ancient sites, going through the attributes of the solar system. It was extraordinary. Then, when we go further down the line to the south, we come to the Temple of Jupiter at Carsley Camp. Now, that's called a Druid core. And I don't know if you're familiar with the name core. That means college or university. So this was a Druid core. It was the uh, Temple of Jupiter. It still exists today, but it's right on the edge of MOD land. And if you go to this side of it in a red flags fly, and you've got a ballistic missile going over your head. And it's like I said uh, when I was with uh, Dolores Cannon on uh, Friday and I was doing my introduction to Stonehenge, and my introduction to Stonehenge is always this, it's surrounded by 16 military camps. It's quite close to Salisbury Plain. Salisbury Plain, this is on the Salisbury Plain, and Salisbury Plain is like our Area 51. You can't go on there, yeah? It's cordoned off by the military. And if you do happen to, to go there when it's a white flag flying, you've got to be really careful where you go, because if you see a red flag, then it's a no-go area. And I was astonished when I went there recently in a white flag zone that there was a massive longbow. Archaeologists and tour guides tell you the biggest long barrow in the landscape is East Kennet Long Barrow or West Kennet. It isn't. It's right close to Stonehenge. It is massive. You imagine now two large West Kennets and add a little bit on. That's the size of the barrows on the Salisbury Plain. No burials in those. And despite the fact, and can you believe this, just 20 years ago, they were using that, that ancient site, that power in the landscape, to put tanks over. That was their, their game of doing it. And despite that, an archaeologist called Bob Clark, because I've studied archaeology, so I can play their number games with them, you see. I studied with the University of Bath, so they can't pull them all over my eyes. But they all said the same thing. Despite the fact that tanks, weighing gosh knows how many tons, had gone over them, it still remained flat, right on the top. And even archaeologists, that baffles them. But here at the Temple of Jupiter, it's a core, a college. Gigantic. Now imagine three times, four times the size of Avebury Henge. This encompasses nearly 70 acres with sophisticated buildings on the inside. You are high on the Salisbury Plain. Go there, Castley Camper, Up Avon. You are so high, you feel like you could touch the stars at night. And when the sun rises, you feel that you can touch the sun. It's a poetic, mystical, beautiful sight, often overlooked. But go there and experience the powers of Jupiter. Because Jupiter expands our consciousness. Jupiter teaches us about philosophy and about how we can really attune to our higher minds. That's why it rules education. And make no mistake, when Oxford University was built, that was one of the first and highest degrees Druidic calls. And that's why Oxford University is where it is. So this represented a place of learning in the times of our ancient ancestors. And the largest bound, kind of smaller than Silbury, but a little bit bigger than the Hatfield uh, Barrow I discussed at Marden, is this massive mound, again on MOD land, and you can't enter that, except we got private permission. And again, the energies, if you test them, and I'll show you that later, they're much higher here than over here in a control area. This is a magical landscape that we live in. And it's a landscape that needs to be reactivated. And if you go to these places with conscious intent and tune in, you activate what was there in the past. And then it kind of literally connects us all together a little bit more. 
Well, Stonehenge needs no introduction, does it? What a mighty British iconic temple. It's unique. It has these lintels going round with these massive trilithons on the inside, these magical blue stones. Today, we see it as grey. And look at all of this. You know, people say, oh, you know, this is really good. It's living. That's not how our ancient ancestors saw Stonehenge. Stonehenge was colourful. So now imagine that these stones are so highly polished, they're silver in the sun and in the moonlight alike. These blue stones were so highly polished that they appeared like a midnight blue. They have feldspar in them, which sparkles, so they look like a star-spangled sky. That's how colourful it was. Go right the way through on the axis line to the centre of Stonehenge, and wow, you meet the altar stone. And the altar stone was 16 feet high, green, flexed with ruby. So that was a beautiful, beautiful stone. And ruby helps it increase acoustic levels. And if you're on the inside of Stonehenge, you can hear much better than when you're on the outside. But according to our ley line theory of Edward Duke, this is the temple of Saturn. And it has 30 gigantic stones going round and 30 gigantic lintels on top. It takes Saturn 30 years to go around the, uh, uh, the ecliptic, not the ecliptic, but around all the signs of the zodiac, rather. So again, we see a lot of synchronicities happening with this lay. And like I said, it was linked with a whole processional way going 22 miles across the ceremonial landscape, linking Avebury, which contains the largest stone circle in the world, which represented the sun and the moon in this system, all the way down across the Salisbury Plain, which we have no right to walk upon now, to Stonehenge in the south. Well, I thought, that's amazing that, you know, our ancient ancestors did that. And it's even more amazing. It was tucked away in an occult library by a mason. So I thought that was quite extraordinary uh, in itself. But I decided, I thought, well, what if, when Edward Duke drew that out, or whoever drew it out, it was like a part was missing. So I said to uh, an astronomer, what if I extended that ley line? Would we get the planets known to more modern-day astrologers and astronomers, such as Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto on this ley line? And if we did, that would be testimony to our ancient ancestors that they were fully aware of the planets not being able to be seen with the naked eye. So this is what we did. We decided to have a... That's not the next slide, actually. <laughs> but we will have a look at that in the moment. But yeah, I put this in at the last moment uh, this morning because the Blue Stone Circle at Stonehenge is absolutely phenomenal. It's smaller, and I pointed it out and said how amazingly bright they were. And this is John Michelle's work. And if you go around the circumference of the Blue Stone Circle and you use uh, its diameter going across, it's 79.20 feet exactly. Not an inch more, not an inch less. And this is John Michelle's uh, work. And then if you start to uh, multiply, you get the diameter of the Earth. You know, and uh, make no mistake, we look to ancient Egypt and say they were the masters. Pythagoras said he got taught mathematics by, by us Brits, by us Druids, by us Druids in Gaul. So we need to think again, turn around. We had a shared culture. There was no main person, be that of uh, Egypt or wherever. We taught an awful lot about this ancient landscape. Here we go. This is uh, the ley line that I was talking about. Well, we decided to extend it to see what would, uh, what would happen. And exactly where you'd expect one of those nodal points, and they're all down here, uh, as we saw earlier, exactly where Uranus should be, we met a mighty temple space called Bellisnap. Who's been to Bellisnap? Hardly anyone. Well, you better get your butts down there then, because it's a beautiful sacred site. It is an amazing sacred site because it's very unusual in its design. When we have a look at Bella Snap, it's called a horn barrow. It goes round like this, and the lay transfers right the way down its axis line like that. Now it's heading towards Stonehenge and the Avebury environs. And this is called a false entrance. It was never meant to be used as an entrance. Quite uh, unusual uh, within the barrow building community of uh, the ancient uh, priesthood. The, the actual entrances to the barrows were kind of over here. And again, you know, we say barrow, we say burial mound, but that was its secondary use. 
Its primary use was much different, categorically. Because I think what happened was the archaeologists found the most latest stage with the bones therein, and they carbon dated it to those eras. But that was because something happened in this landscape. Something happened so extraordinary, it changed an entire cultural mindset. Around about 2500 BC, if we use the Orthodox timeline, and that can be easily challenged, but if we use their timeline nonetheless, around about 2500 BC, all the long barrows, if we call them that, initiation chambers, whatever they were used for, were all decommissioned. Every single one. And we have thousands across Northern Europe. And they decommissioned them by filling all the kind of uh, chambers up, so jam-packed with earth, so jam-packed, that it wasn't until the 1950s that the last chamber at West Kennet Longbow near Avery was discovered. Why did they do that? We really, really don't know. And then, like in a grand finale, in Indiana Jones style, they got huge blocking stones weighing up to 12 and 40 tons, blocking those entrances forever until the archaeologists and ourselves go and visit them. So we need to think what went down in 2500 BC, because all of these were decommissioned, then the stone circles uh, were being built. But nonetheless, this landed on our point for, for Uranus, and Uranus is about higher intuition. Uranus inspires us. It gives you a flash of intuition. It is truly a phenomenal place. And uh, lots of people that have interacted with uh, this ley line say just in the kind of near middle, there's an area where a lot of people experience visions, hear voices, understand something about themselves that possibly they didn't know about before. It gives us something. And that's what the landscape and the energies do. They give us something quite unique. And these are the barrows here. But like I say, imagine what our ancestors did in 2500 BC. They pushed dirt in, pushed dirt in, huge blocking stone there. This is a reconstruction in the 1950s where they were cleared out for people like us to go in today. But our ancient ancestors, I don't think, wanted us in these barrows for whatever uh, reasons. But it is a beautiful sight, so, so do go there. And when we look at Neptune on that uh, extended ley line, Neptune is lord of the seas and earthquakes as well, actually. And right at the point where Neptune has its nodal point, you have Hengisbury Head. And close by, you have Dilston, which strangely and synchronistically has a huge globe with Neptune uh, depicted on it. So just, well, it's just over here, actually, where the line goes, you have, again, round barrows dated to about 2500 BC. It's an amazing feat of our ancestors. And possibly, just like within the Avebury environs, you had that part of the lay dug out so that you could walk there ceremonially. So I said to you, here hearing that Andy Collins is coming to speak uh, this afternoon, and uh, Andy Collins worked with a chap called Rodney Hale, and Rodney Hale ca calculated the sickness alignment uh, for Andy, and I've known Rodney for many, many years. And I said to, to Rodney Hale, well, look, what if uh, this ley line represented an actual point in time, an actual moment in time? Do you reckon you could calculate that for me? Because he really knows how to use software very efficiently. And after, oh, many days, he said, I've come up with some times. And this is mirrored in the land. This is now that ley line, but this is now in the skies. And that was 2746 BC. But I don't think that was the date they were built. I think that's the day that people went there and they were reactivated because I think the timeline goes further back, much, much longer, possibly to about 10,000 BC. Because archaeologists always use the youngest date that they find. So let's say I'm digging here, I've got two bits of carbon material. Wow, that's the holy grail to an archaeologist. I can date this. I can date this carbon. So let's say one was 7,000 BC and one was 2,000 BC. For reasons that are inexplicable, they choose the 2,000 BC. But yet at Stonehenge, they found things going back to 12,000 BC. And instead of getting more and more progressed, like you think, because we look at Avebury and people tell us that's 3000 BC, 
You get what's called lithics. They're pieces of stone. You could use surgery with them. And they cut skin. They cut through uh, any fabric easily, much better than scissors and metal. In 12,000 BC, they were more sophisticated than in 3,000 BC. So don't think the timeline gets more progressive. Sometimes it actually goes backwards as well. So I think this was an era when that whole lay network was activated. And uh, the people would then link into the power of heaven above to that which is below. So that's extraordinary. And this isn't kind of a rare event because what Rodney decided to do was have a look at other events in history. Each time there's been activation, each time there's been people go into Stonehenge, go into Avebury, these planets line up. I mean, even if we use the orthodox timescales, these two dates I've shown you with this planetary alignment are very, very important. Because, again, at Stonehenge, uh, in Virons, which represents our Saturn, Saturn is lord of time. Saturn represents our karma, if you will. And there's a massive monument that was once stood in front of Stonehenge. Not a little monument, two miles long, right in front of Stonehenge. So visualize Stonehenge now and visualize this massive monument called the Cursor's Monument, all built of a white brick with no entrance. No entrance whatsoever. Ten feet high walls all around in, in, in a huge enclosure. My late father and I, many moons ago in the, in the late 80s and the 90s, we did a whole series of Geiger count tests right at the centre of that ancient monument. And round about the time of the spring equinox, there's a massive outpouring of gamma radiation. Gamma radiation isn't particularly good for you. It really can damage you know, your cells, you know, it can give you cancer. But what I think was happening with that gamma radiation was that our ancient ancestors were prehistoric physicists and alchemists, and they could change energy, and I'm sure they could change gamma radiation. I actually said to Michael Parker Pearson, I've said to quite a few of the top archaeologists, do you know what the curses was for, Maria? It's all about death. What happened there then? Oh, well, they did. They walked up and down with dead bodies. Ah, how did they get in there? Do they slide down? How did you get the dead body out? Do you somehow throw it over a 10-foot wall? <laughs> How would you do that? And they go, oh, yeah, but that's what we think is going on. They don't write about that monument. They have hardly any information about that monument, I can assure you, despite many, many digs. What I'm going to do now for the uh, last half hour of the presentation is we're going to have a look at some earth energies now and sacred site design canon and the energy these places emit. And because stones are magical things and landscapes are incredible because what our ancient ancestors were fully aware of is the power in the land. And the power in the land are energy points that emit energy that is so strong, it can change your consciousness. It can change you physically. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to see how these ancient sites can literally change our energy levels. Those that have come dousing with me have known, and I can see a few of you in the audience actually, now, I've always talk, spoken about the geospiral phenomenon. The geospiral is a massive Earth energy spiral. It spirals normally in seven coils. It always, always marks the esoteric center of a monument, be that a pyramid, be that a stone circle. Even stately homes designed by masons, and we have the Rothschilds near Avebury, they uh, also use this as the esoteric center, or the pattern closest to it. I mean, my mum, and I say this to people, my mum really loves Downton Abbey. She'll watch there, and she's really in her comfort zone. She loves it. But you know when it, you go down to a stately home, you go down a huge sweeping drive, don't you? And then you arrive at the center. You're arriving symbolically at their esoteric center. According to John Michel, Peking is, at modern day Beijing, is at the esoteric center of China. It's the power. And when you have this spiral pattern, it emits a force field that I'll describe in a moment. But what makes this pattern? I'm a second generation water diviner. And what I know about water divining is if you want good, healthy water, if you want an inexhaustible supply of water, then you look for this pattern and that's where you bore. Now, 
We drink normally tap water. I mean, I'm on imploded water. I, I would not drink tap water, but most of us are on tap water. Well, I can stand here and say truthfully, 100%, you can bet your bottom dollar that all of the moneyed people in this landscape are on that type of water. This is sacred water. It is healthy water. It is deep and expensive to bore. When it breaks through to the surface, that's your medicinal holy spring. Where you bore it, that's your holy well. It's saying it's a different type of water that comes to the surface because this is the harmonic pattern of a special type of underground water, yin water, primary water. And it was always called that by water diviners. And I've talked about this for years. You know, this is the sacred water. It emits a healing energy field. And recently, Dr. Gerald Pollock has written a book called The Fourth Phase of Water. And the fourth phase of water is saying there's something different about deep water. It is an H2O. It has a completely different structure. It's, in fact, H3O2. That's the water our ancestors were drinking. Now, our governments are going to be telling us in a few years' time, oh, we're running out of water. This is perpetual. It's born and generated deep within the womb of the earth. All planetary bodies can generate water. And with the work of Dr. Gerald Pollock, I can say that we're really starting to understand how healing this water is and how healing it energy field is. So now imagine a monument, a bit like Stonehenge. This was done, uh, a survey by Guy Underwood in the 1960s. Here's the massive geospiral. That's why the altar stone isn't at the geometric center of Stonehenge. It's offset. It's the esoteric center, not the geometric center. That's why Avery's uh, obelisk marker stone marks the esoteric center. And like I say, all stately homes, all large museums, all large places of learning are built on an esoteric center. Now, this uh, spiral pattern then starts to generate under huge lakes of this yin water, this H3OT, H3O2, this circular pattern, and then this massive halo pattern here. This has been known since time immemorial to water diviners. So they would go to what's called the esoteric center to get the healing waters. But it does generate this pattern. It's a threefold pattern. Now, on the circular pattern, and all standing stones normally are on this inner section here, that's why they have a circular pattern, because they're on this energy pattern here, uh, generated by the underground uh, water. And what happens with this uh, inner shadow here, for reasons that uh, aren't fully understood, it really generates and charges up the outer halo, so they swap places forever, recharging like this. And uh, this is where I think the vision should go. What if we started to build, you know, uh, places, schools of learning, you know, helping uh, children to learn faster by uh, citing schools on these energy patterns? And I'm really proud to say, actually, just recently, I taught some uh, architects in London how to douse. One uh, young guy, he's about 30, he designs all the play parks in kind of rough areas of London, actually. And he said to me, Maria, what can I do with, uh, with dowsing to get those really special places that the earth emits to make the children calm, to switch their minds on a little bit more? So I showed him these types of earth energy patterns, and we've built now our sixth play park on these patterns in areas to calm those kids down. Now, when we look to that whole energy pattern with that halo and the circles and a geospiral, that's exactly how Stonehenge is laid out. Stonehenge is a healing temple. It's a temple that has a resonance of electromagnetic energy that is so intense that if you go there, you will feel a difference. So what evidence is there that it's a healing temple then? Well, just over the other side of the road, where that Cursor's monument was that I was describing, you have the Cursor's barrows. And from inside the Cursor's barrows, you have evidence of brain surgery and trepanin. They were committing some really amazing surgery there. And look at all this amazing yin water. This is mapped out many, many, many decades ago by uh, two dowsers, Chris Bird from America, doing Avebury. Look at all of these yin streams. And these are all yin streams at Stonehenge, very holy places, with a, a dense amount of uh, yin water therein. 
And here we have the layout of very old style cities that are circular or horseshoe in nature because it was always believed by old dowsers and water diviners alike that this horseshoe pattern, it's called a secondary halo, has protective properties. And it was believed that if you build your uh, wall around this kind of natural protective energy, your city would be safe. And that was the idea behind it. And there are smaller patterns like this in the earth. Because even animals, they recognize what's right for them. They recognize what's good for them. And hence, in the wild, uh, they were in the wild at one time, <laughs> when they were in the wild, they looked to particular types of protective earth energy patterns. And that's where they'd roost. That's where they'd stay. That's why they survived the evolutionary system. If you put your chicken coop onto a particular earth energy pattern, foxes ignore it. Animals know where they should be and where they shouldn't be in the ancient landscape. And again, I think if we're building modern places, and Africa and India are going to be urbanized as part of the kind of you know, worldwide project, or call it what you will, and I think we need to uh, build on this. I grew up with uh, you know, uh, apartheid in the UK. You know, Nelson Mandela was having freedom issues, and it was a very sad time with the divide between white and black, because we're all one race or one family, really. And uh, my dad taught a lot of people to douse uh, in South Africa, and he said, I'm going to make you a healthy people. I'm going to make you a strong people. And we went out of our way to show where they could bore deep yin water. And uh, because you start drinking this water, and it, it will make a change to your life. And there's a magical moment when you bore for that deep water. It is truly, truly amazing. Once all the gunk comes off, like the chalk and the dirt, and, and you have just the pure water coming out, there's a ritual that all water diviners do. You always water divine for yin water on a sunny day. The first thing yin water must see is the sun above. It's yin and yang. It's like alchemy. It's an alchemic uh, ritual. And you get the glass, you put it to the sunlight like that, and it glints like a diamond. It is truly uh, amazing water. So what happens then when you put a standing stone into this magical water and all these energy patterns? They start to behave in a coherent manner. And again, I've, I've taken people around the Avery and Stonehenge environs, and we've doused for these energies. Imagine that this stone is rooted into the ground, so it's got another two bands below because the stone is in the ground. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven all in all, energy bands that reflect our chakra system, you know, because we have our seven chakras. Now, this band here is amazing because it trans transmits a signal to that stone, to that stone, to that stone, to that stone, creating an intense field of electromagnetic energy. And we know this and we can prove this. This band here, band number three, is extraordinary because in the uh, test that we've been doing, it can change your body weight. I mean, Busty Taylor's uh, here today in the conference, when we put a sensitive weight measuring equipment on him and he leant against the stone, just imagine that's all you're doing now, you're leaning against the stone, within six, six to seven seconds, he weighed two stone heavier. Come away from the stone, your weight goes back to normal, yeah? Now, I'm always after losing a couple of pounds, me. So I thought, well, it can't just be putting on weight. What if I kind of have a go? Because with my late father and everyone, they said you could be pushed away and you feel lighter. So they put the weight uh, detecting equipment on me, and I interacted with the energy there. And whoa, I started to lose pound after pound after pound. No weight watchers there, Maria. So that was quite handy. And then I suddenly thought, well, what if the ancients could manipulate that? What if the ancients could somehow manipulate that band. And I'm sure you've heard of Sam from the Bosnian Pyramids, haven't you, here? Uh, he's very well known and a very charismatic guy. Well, he said to me, do you know what? Uh, there's a special frequency, because I'm going to show you some frequencies in a moment. And he said, it's 25 hertz. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, that is the frequency of levitation. And I went, oh my God, Sam, that OMG moment. And I said, that's the frequency of some of the earth currents, like Mary and Michael, Ellen and Bellinas. What if you put the two together? You have the frequency of 25 hertz naturally emitted by the energy currents, and then you, you manipulate this energy line here. Because let's face it, moving stone wasn't a problem to our ancestors. Why archaeologists think it was a problem, I, I am not aware of. 
They knew that. Now, Rodney Hale, who I said, you know, links with Andy Collins, and, and he links with me, I said to him, what if we can get the frequency, what if we can prove categorically that these energy bands, these stone chakras exist? Because I can tell you I was the butt of a joke with the archaeologists. Bear in mind, I know a lot of them. And I used to do archaeological tours with them. Uh, and I was always the butt of the joke. You're so touchy-touchy, feely-feely, you can't prove a goddamn thing. We were in the Red Lion. I had two pints of Stella. I was starting to feel a bit brave. So I said, right, I'm going to bet you a hundred quid now that I can prove this categorically. Game on, they said. Rodney brought all of his equipment uh, with him, and uh, I prayed to Mother Earth, but I knew that these existed anyway. And lo and behold, Rodney got these frequencies exactly. Clever chap, he had a laptop with all these uh, fancy graphs. Clever chap again, he made it audible so you could hear it. It would go zzzz, then dead quiet, then like zzzz again. Absolutely amazing, that test that Rodney uh, did. And then he said to me, Maria, I can get the hertz frequency of that as well. It's 18 hertz. And he looked at me as if I should know what 18 hertz meant. And I said, what does 18 hertz mean then, Rodney? He said, you hear at 20. What if our ancient ancestors had just that better hearing? They weren't, you know, e-smogged out. I'm surrounded by an electromagnetic e-smog field, electromagnetic smog. What if they could hear the sounds of the stones as well? What if they could hear that third energy band? That's what I think uh, is, is happening. So I think with the frequencies that these stones emit, the frequencies that the earth emits, the ancients were fully aware of this and they could manipulate and work in harmony with Gaia, work in harmony with the site. And they placed the standing stones all upon these high energy places with their circular energy patterns, with that halo pattern and with the geospiral pattern. And then they linked them in a straight line or near straight line. And the ancient Druids said there's 12 great circles that encompass the earth. Because if you project a ley line right the way around the earth, it becomes a mighty circle. So that duke line goes all the way up to Scotland. It hits the most northerly tip, goes around the uh, Arctic areas and comes back round. That's a ley line proper. And with these planetary nodal points on them, these activation points in time and space, that's when the, uh, the energies of the land really, really do uh, unite and activate these ancient sites. We've all probably heard of Harry Oldfield as well, haven't we? Yes. Yay for Harry. Uh, well, I'm really pernickety about where Earth energy is and where it isn't. So Harry's uh, colleague came with me to this beautiful site called Wayland Smithy. I'm sure we've been to Wayland Smithy, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, that's better than Bella Snap, isn't it? And then I said to them, well, this should register energy because it's rooted in to uh, an earth current called Ellen, discovered by Gary Billcliffe. And these shouldn't because they have less energy because they're not so rooted into the ground. And this is what Harry got. And it's reflecting the chakra system of colours, isn't it? Going from reds through to violets uh, above. And extraordinary, when you lean against those stones, what our photographic evidence suggested was somehow, if you've got a kind of chakra out of balance, you know, let's say my solar plexus chakra, for example, you have more yellow energy around you. Those that had an active third eye would have more violet around them when they touched those sacred bands of the stones. So again, Rodney said, we're going to have to get an experiment for this, Maria, to see what's really going on. And he's really clever. He made over 2,000 meters of copper coils going round and round and round and round. And he said, you have to remove all metal objects, whereas well, out come the earrings, off came all the bling. And, uh, and so I stood in there, just the co coil alone, like this, and we recognized what's called the Schumann resonance. That's like the heartbeat of Gaia. It's a beautiful frequency, about 711 hertz. Whenever you're in that frequency field, and it is apparent on the stones and at Avebury, your brain comes into sync with that lovely, relaxed way of feeling. And it's always there at ancient sites. So that was me in the coil, uh, coil alone. Then I decided just to kind of stand upright by stepping into the coil and slight activity going on there, just around here. But then as soon as I put my hands on the stones, whoosh, 
electromagnetic activity going into my auric field or my physical uh, body. And uh, that was uh, registered. And it was a boomph moment. You don't have to stand there for 20 minutes. As soon as my hands went on, boomph, that went off within two seconds of that. So what we decided to do after that was for me then to stand upright. Now, I'm standing, going away from the stone, standing upright, and it was extraordinary because the energy stayed with me. In fact, I was tested for four days later, then another four days, then another four days. What we realize is happening when you interact with the stones is for up to four days, the energy is still building up in my auric field and my physical body. So I touch the stones for two seconds, and yet my body is expanding and its auric field, my electromagnetic field, is getting greater and greater and greater as time goes on to a maximum of four days. So, I mean, a lot of incredible things are happening at these ancient sites. So, again, you know, when you go there, you don't have to stay long. But we're living in an electromagnetic era. And what one researcher has found at places like Rollwright, that is a stone circle proper, because it hasn't been you know, smashed up like Avebury and Stonehenge, is these stones, on the energy bands, they are made to design, they're designed rather to emit energy. That's what they're designed for, yeah? Because there is no difference between uh, a silicon chip of Silicon Valley, this is, this is absolutely true, on the inside, it's crystal matrix structure, to uh, this, this standing stone here, to a silicon chip. They are one and the same. In fact, my, uh, my late father used to call these macro chips because they're so bloody big. So he'd say that, they're macro chips. But they are starting to emit electromagnetic man-made frequencies. We all have a mobile phone, we all need our laptops, but that will, I think, become more prevalent the more masks and things we put up. But nonetheless, at the moment, with this Schumann residence, they do seem to have uh, a healing energy field about them. So I do say to people, you know, as soon as you walk into a stone circle, as soon as you walk into an ancient site, you're changing. You can't hear the energies of the stones any longer. You can't see its energy field. But just imagine now that you're Avebury. You're being blended in this rainbow light. And we've all heard of ley lines. I've described one today. And around some ley lines, you get these meandering currents called Mary and Michael or Ellen and Bellinas, whatever. They were recognized in ancient China. Now, where these earth energies move through the landscape, where they go deep into the earth at what's called a nodal point, they take the higher chakra colors in with them first. And where they come out of the ground, they come out in the red to, through to the violet sequence. So they're almost like taking the positive energy of the site back into the earth or vice versa as they journey around the globe. Linking site after site, by the way, because that uh, sixth energy band towards the top, we got signals to the next stone circle. So these energy bands link stone circle after stone circle across the ceremonial landscape. I mean, this is ingenious. And I always say to guests that come with me uh, around AFB, this is Neolithic Wi-Fi, no wires. I also love sites that have been long gone, for example. I've shown you the uh, Temple of Venus, and I showed you Marden. Well, I've, I've done a lot of research in the States because uh, I spent my 13th to 17th years as a teenager growing up in Pennsylvania. So I went to Serpent Mound with my dad, Cahokia, and all of these amazing places. And uh, this was their most sacred site in the Native American tradition. But the Native Americans themselves said, we didn't build it. This is the kings of kings. So the kings of kings built this site that the later Native Americans uh, used. You have, uh, oops, sorry. And you have this uh, circular uh, enclosure here and this pentagon shape here. Well, the designer of uh, the pentagon was a chap called George Bergstrom. Yeah, he lived next door to that. So I'm sure that's where he got the design from. Yeah, he lived in Wisconsin. And uh, he has always gone down in history that he designed that in just five days. Now, the Native Americans had a mythology. They had a belief system about this site. And it's not a particularly nice one either. They believed that every spring equinox and every autumn equinox, people must die. 
Yeah, because they had to empower their warriors. So you, you'd actually go quite willingly, you know, say, hey, you know, I, I, it's an honor to die that way. So what they used to do is they used to take uh, all the warriors would be around this massive uh, henge enclosure around here, and then they would perform sacrifice, and each of the blood spilling would represent the strengthening of America, the strengthening of its military power, the strengthening of the five senses to beat your component uh, each time. It represented the head of the Americas. So the Native Americans, this was one of the most hollow places uh, to go. So I, again, I don't think it's any mistake that the Pentagon is built on a very similar uh, principle. And it's sad to think that the, the military have taken that mythology of that ancient site and put it into their military power now. And there was five of these uh, in America. In fact, George Bergstrom was around at the time when um, he was in his 20s that this was ordered to be dis uh, destroyed and uh, Bergstrom uh, drew it out, and that's how uh, the Pentagon uh, came into being. So even the shapes of modern-day buildings, they all mean something, because take the White House, for, for instance, with that dome shape. Well, that's built on Earth energy principles as well, yeah, because you can manipulate things, you can get them. I mean, I like to think it's for the greater good of all, but you can uh, manipulate uh, these types of uh, energies and their energy fields. So these five massive pentagons were all linked in a massive pentagon shape like that in uh, Wisconsin with a huge line going through it with seven other sites on it, very similar to Edward Duke's planetary lay system. In fact, you know, when you come to, to the Americas, and bear in mind that the first uh, settlers, they demanded that these sites go, but they kept records of them. You have a, a wonderful, wonderful place in America called Newark in Ohio. It is the largest henge in the world, far, far bigger than Avery. Now imagine three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty times bigger than Avery. That was Newark. Now imagine 60 miles of ceremonial uh, earthworks. You would travel 60 miles across the landscape. America's sacred sites were linked through massive earthworks. I think our sacred sites were linked through massive stone corridors as well. And that was ordered for that whole site uh, to be uh, bulldozed down. So that's a, a very sad, but they're still activated now. And the Native Americans, so they said it was the kings of kings that built these sites. And they were really extraordinary because you do get uh, rainfall around these uh, states in America. And uh, the kings of kings made them waterproof. So every year you just wiped it off and it was like a waterproof system. Very, very uh, ingenious. Plato, as we know, wrote of Atlantis, and uh, Plato said that um, right in the center was a very special area. You had a kind of small mountain, you had these uh, inlays of like rivers, and he said how fertile it was, and hey, that's where we get our records about Atlantis uh, today from. So that's how he drew it with, you know, in between uh, America and obviously uh, Spain and uh, Africa over to that side. Now, this was the design of, uh, of the great uh, place and capital of Atlantis. And you had right uh, in the center, according to Plato, two springs. Now, he said these were like really deep springs. They were massively uh, deep and they were sacred. And this whole place was dedicated to Poseidon or Neptune. Ingeniously, they got these waters out of the earth and created these gigantic rings of healing waters. And that's what we should look at these as being. These are healing waters going right the way around uh, Atlantis and creating uh, an energetic field as well because water interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and generates its own healing field around that. So that was described by Plato. This was three cartwheels of massive capital, really utilizing the deep yin waters uh, within the ground. And then around this uh, massive capital area is where people would live. You would have houses and you would have the outer city. And on these places here, which we we'll see they were set to an earth energy pattern, would be horse racing. 
And uh, John Michelle, I mentioned earlier, that slide that I, I put in, Stonehenge's diameter is 79.20 feet across. If you get 15 miles, that equates to 79,200 feet exactly, which is the, the width of the capital of uh, Atlantis. And then you divide that, you get, again, the diameter of the Earth. So it's when we have these kind of sacred waters, often it encompasses in their kind of math mathematical understanding the diameter of the Earth. But now you're in an energy field. And I think that's what Atlantis was doing with these massive waterways and these cartwheels of water. They were generating an energetic uh, healing field. And also it irrigated the land because Plato described that all of these uh, channels linked to irrigate the land here. So now you have pure water irrigating what you eat. I mean, that is very, very pure and, uh, and very, very sacred. So I think they were definitely using the uh, Earth energy system. And uh, five minutes, yeah. That's a good time to plug my book then, isn't it? Yeah. And what, uh, what I've done here, just before uh, we do finish within our five minutes, my book will be out. Sadly, it got held up in customs in Hamburg. I didn't hide anything in the sleeves. But it got ha held up in Hamburg. So it wasn't here for, for today. But that's uh, describing all these types of uh, earth energies and sites worldwide to interact with earth energies. But again, I'm really proud to say that you see the... Uh, you know, those uh, Illuminati, or call them what you will, the, the New World Order, they bury themselves in particular ways. It's death rites. It gets rid of what's called your earth karma. So you look for particular types of earth energy. They're called the coil of the dragon, and it's said to release your uh, energy fields. Well, I'm working with the, the biggest designer of graves. Never thought I'd hear myself say that. But uh, we're bringing back the old death rites, and this is in Liverpool, of all places. And uh, we've designed it based on crop circles and earth energy energy patterns so that people can get buried on these energy patterns that we've marked out with beautiful walkways. You've got like a crop circle here. These are all like calls of the dragon. And that's where people can be buried because we can play that game too, can't we, New World Order? And here we have a play park designed on the earth energy principles because my vision, my true heart lies in ancient wisdom should be for modern generation. It's okay having all of this wisdom. Well, and I can go to Egypt and feel nice. I can go to Avery and feel nice. But my, my heart lies in the design canons of the future. There are certain energy lines that enhance your ability to communicate. What if autistic kids were put on those energy lines? What if people, I'm, I'm dyslexic, what if people that have reading and writing issues were taught at schools on these lines? So that's where my heart is going because I can really see there's a wave of interest in all of this. We have a younger generation coming up now that is questioning the timelines of these uh, archaeologists. They know it went back further. But they also know these places make us feel special. And if we can take that principle and work with those energies today, we truly will live with heaven on earth. Thank you.